and again, welcome to Anthropology 4310, Theories of Culture. Uh, we are continuing our series of student presentations where students get to take the various theories or a theory that they have chosen and they give it a kind of dramaturgical interpretation and, uh, and so far we have been pleased with what's happened. Uh, and today we're going to have two uh, additional groups of students. Uh, the first one, uh, first group is going to uh, talk to us about the uh, structuralism. Uh, some of that theoretical content was addressed by Dr. Rasmussen in her two lectures a couple of weeks ago. And I'm sure it will be a, a continuation of that information. And the second group will be something that we haven't talked about before. Uh, which nonetheless is interesting and one I always found exciting because it, it does that interesting combination of linguistics and ethnology where you take linguistic models and you apply them to ethnographic data and you're able to come up with some kinds of uh, other cultural logics, if you will. And sometimes those uh, linguistic models can be used as uh, methodolo methodological instruments for gaining information. So, ethnoscience is a, a really uh, was an exciting. I say was because I, I currently don't know anyone who's specifically uh, continuing to engage in that research. Uh, but nonetheless, it's an important chapter because it, it reunites these interests of both linguistics and ethnology together. So, without further ado, we're now going to go to a work time while the students set up, and the first student group, again, will be structuralism, and the second, uh, with another work study period, then the second group will be ethnoscience, and then you'll see me later again. <laughs> Hey, what's up? What's up, baby? <laughs> hey, what's going on? What's on uh, the agenda for today? Well, well, we just got a new shipment in from some archaeologists, and it's a broken down totem pole that they want us to reconstruct. Oh, yeah. Mm. This is the, the one that we've been expecting. The, the structuralism. Stru right. And, uh, that one. The uh, curator wants us to put it together so we can uh, have it as a display? Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, in, uh, um, in order for us to uh, put this structuralist totem pole together, we're going to have to understand uh, uh, some ideas about structuralism. So let's begin with uh, the main concepts of structuralism. 
All right. Does that sound good? Okay. <laughs> All right. In so far as uh, structuralism is concerned, the search for structure in culture and society should be uh, the nucleus of anthropology. So we're going to have to go with that. Further, the problems which uh, confront most anthropologists, according to proponents of structuralism, can best be expressed as a series of questions. These questions are, one, how can the social behavior of any group be most exactly, meaningfully, and intelligibly described? Two, how can these social phenomena be uh, accounted for or explained? More important, how do the different sets of social phenomena within a single group, its myths, its systems of kinship, marriage, etc., relate one to another and to the totality? And three, what are the interrelations, if any, that exist between social groups as wholes, uh, whether they be primitive tribes, feudal states, or advanced industrial societies? What, what do they have in common that might provide a basis for meaningful comparison? Structuralism, in the eyes of its practitioners, constitutes a method for handling these questions and for ordering the raw material of observed facts in order to answer these questions. And I use the word method because structuralism belongs clearly to the category of methods rather than of theories in that it prescribes certain operations and ways of working upon data, although in so doing it makes certain theoretical assumptions. And these assumptions namely are, one, all patterns of human social behavior are codes with the characteristics of languages. <coughs> two, man has an innate structuring capacity which determines the limits within which the structure of all types of social phenomena can be formed. And three, relations can be reduced to binary oppositions. Structuralism is presented as a method whose scope includes all human social phenomena, no matter what their form. Thus, structuralism embraces not only the social sciences, but the humanities and the fine arts as well. This is made possible by the belief that all manifestations of social activity, whether it be the clothes that are worn, the books that are written, or the systems of kinship and marriage that are practiced in any society, constitute languages in a formal sense. Hence, their regularities may be reduced to the same set of abstract rules that define and govern what we normally think of as language. In an attempt to reduce terminological confusion, uh, the word code is sometimes used, notably by Roland Barthes, uh, to cover all types of socially employed systems of communication. And these, uh, these social codes are seen to have, um, like natural languages, a lexicon or a vocabulary. For example, uh, in the case of kinship and marriage, as described by Claude Levi-Strauss, all those members of a society who stand in a kinship relation to other members constitute the lexicon of permissible terms. The rules about who may or who may not marry whom constitutes the syntax or the grammar. This in, in turn uh, determines what elements may be legitimately pieced together. In Observing um, this outward, observable structure, however, uh, which is also called a surface structure, is not the interest of structuralism. Rather, structuralism seeks its uh, structure below or, or behind empirical reality. In other words, within a deep structure. Uh, Levi-Strauss compares this idea with the practice of people using or speaking their own language, though they consistently and constantly apply its phonological and grammatical laws, i.e. its structure, in their speech they are not, unless they are versed in linguistics, 
uh, consciously aware of these laws, nor, if asked, would they be able to uh, supply these laws. Um, and the same is true, the structuralists argue, of all social activity. What the observer sees is not the structure but simply the evidence and product of the structure. However, though the structure of any activity is not itself what can be seen, it can only be derived from or understood by way of what is seen. Moreover, there seems to be general agreement among most structuralists, notably Levi Strauss and Roman Jakobsen, that there is in man an innate genetically transmitted and determined mechanism that acts as a structuring force. Furthermore, this inherent quality or capacity is so designed as to limit the possible range of ways of structuring. It has been pointed out, for example, that the structures of natural languages represent only a very restricted spectrum of the possible structures of language. Levi Strauss, in turn, has argued that as groups have developed structural means of resolving conflict, inconsistencies and ambiguities have arisen between different elements of the surface structure due to the uh, limits within which the structure of phenomena can be formed as, as these are produced by the deep or underlying structure. Finally, <laughs> probably the most distinctive feature of the structuralist method is the emphasis it gives to holes to totalities. Within structuralism, a great emphasis, uh, a great importance has been given to uh, the priority of the whole over its parts. Structuralists insist that the whole and the parts can be properly, properly explained only in terms of the relations that exist between the parts. This leads to the fundamental tenet of the structuralist method, and that is the attempt to study the complex network of relationships that link and unite the elements of a whole. And these relations exist at the level of the deep structure, though, of course, they are reflected at the level of the observable empirical reality, in other words, at the level of the surface structure. These relations can be reduced to binary oppositions, for example, night, day, fire, water, land, sea. And although these are not logically pairs of complementary, exhaustive, mutually exclusive categories <laughs> in the sense of formal logics A and not A, uh, they are nevertheless perceived as such by the groups who employ such terms in their myths, their kinship terminologies, etc. And furthermore, structuralism is primarily synchronic rather than diachronic. <laughs> structuralism focuses upon relations across a moment in time, rather than through time. Moreover, the synchronic structure is seen as being constituted or determined not by any historical process, but by the network of existing structural relations. This structuralism is largely unconcerned with history and or historical processes. Wow. And that, I think, are the main concepts of structuralism. I think you covered everything. <laughs> And so. having this said, I think that the base of our totem pole should be this right here. Wow. What well, do you all think? Do you agree? Absolutely. Looks good. It <laughs> looks good. But who developed all of these theories of structuralism? Who were the influential people who came up with this? Well, um, I guess we should start at the beginning with uh, Claude Levi Strauss. He's considered to be the father of structuralism. Through his writing and research, the ideas of French structuralism blossomed. He was born in 1908 in Brussels to a family of artists, and he went to college and pursued degrees in law and philosophy, but his interests lie in the uh, field of anthropology. After a short stint in field work in Brazil, he wrote a book on his experiences called Tristes Tropique, but he did very little if no field work after that. During World War II, Levi Strauss immigrated to America and began a teaching career at the New, York School of, the New School of Research in New York City. It was in America that he wrote two of his most important and well-known books, The Elementary Structures of Kinship in 1949 and Structural Anthropology in 1958. 
These books both propose that reciprocal exchange among groups aids in alliances, social interaction, and in cohesive societies. He especially focused on the exchange of women and social groups. He pointed out that the exchange of women occurs in four different types of relationships. Brother, sister, husband, wife, mother's brother or uncle, and sister's son or nephew, and father, son. He also believed in the notion that form is just as important as the content, and that's one of the, the ideas most central to structuralism. Another one of his books, uh, The Raw and the Cooked, emphasizes cultural metaphors in cooking. He noted that because boiled foods are served only to kinspeople and roasted foods are served only to strangers, a metaphor uh, between culture and nature can be found. That's boiling is to roasting as a culture is to nature. Levi-Strauss influenced many people in ways of thought, such as the new Marxists led by Maurice Godelier and post-structuralists like Michel Foucault. In turn, he was influenced by many of the other great minds of so the social sciences. Uh, one of his first influences was the Prague School, um, and that focused on linguistics. Um, Roman Jakobson was the leader of the Prague School, and uh, his most important theory to the structuralists is the idea that sounds is, um, of speech are organized into opposing pairs or binary opposition. Another linguist that influenced Levi Strauss was Ferdinand de Saussure. Uh, he focused mostly on the abstract parts of language, uh, utterances, and that kind of thing. Um, he felt that there was an unspoken set of rules governing speech, and he was also very influential on in the development of the idea of phonemes, or uh, sounds that can change the meaning of words. For example, because, uh, uh, because of a simple change in a vowel sound, the words uh, beat and bit mean something completely different. Other influences of Levi-Strauss's Levi were Marcel Moss and uh, Emile Durkheim. Durkheim believed that uh, cognition is shaped by culture. And uh, many of Moss's theories also echo and reiterate what uh, Durkheim wrote. Both of them believe that taxonomies of the natural world are far too complicated for the human mind to grasp and construct by itself. That if they're um, only if they're surviving on instincts alone. But they um, both also believe that classification is collective in origin. And uh, Moss was very important to Levi Strauss's theories. In fact, um, Levi Strauss considered Moss to be one of the uh, forefathers of structuralism. And in 1924, Moss published a revolutionary essay called The Gift, in which he brought the, f the focus of uh, many studies from group minds to just the individual mind. He, like Durkheim, focused on rep rep reciprocity, and uh, he even defined it as to give, to receive, and to repay. He also saw um, mental structure as the universal way of governing social order and kinship. Wow. That's all. That's good. So I think the next block would be this one. I think you're right. It fits very well. Fits in nicely. Um, but in in having these things, I think that we should uh, explore how some of the people expanded upon these ideas in certain areas. Okay. For example, with regard to myth, as it relates to structuralism, Claude Levi Strauss made an attempt to expand upon the study of structure and culture by focusing on myths. Levi Strauss believed that the study of the mythologies of primitive peoples allows for the examination of the unconscious universal patterning of human thought that it, which is in its most uncontaminated form. Such mythologies, those of uh, primitive peoples, are closer to these universal principles or patterns than our Western beliefs because Western beliefs are buried underneath uh, layers of cultural interference caused by Western social environment. In his studies on myth, Levi Strauss expanded on the notion of binary oppositions as related to the structure of human cognition. Further, Levi Strauss asserted that a main characteristic of human thought is the effort to find a midpoint between such binary oppositions. Given this, uh, despite such layers of cultural interferences as found in Western beliefs, modern Western myths as well can be examined for unconscious patternings that act as a form of dialogue. It's just you have to go deeper within its structure. So, so in essence, uh, Levi Strauss focuses on what the myth is communicating rather than what the myth is about. In other words, Levi Strauss believes that myth is a form of communication. One has to break a myth down into its parts, its constituent units. 
and important to these parts is its pairs of opposites. This is what enables one to get at meaning in myth. In other words, pairs of opposites create patterns of thought, and these patterns form categories. This is analogous to a musical piece or an orchestral score. Um, in orchestral music, for example, there are recurring themes, and as well there are different levels within the music operating simultaneously. People have this same underlying mental logic within their capacity of cognition. The details may vary, but the themes are, are fundamentally the same. As a result, there are striking similarities among the uh, world's myths. For example, people universally regard incest as inherently wrong, as a social taboo. And this taboo is, usually, is, is universally expressed in myths throughout the world. Therefore, within the structure of myth, there is, for example, a defining of marriage and kinship. And when one defines marriage in, and kinship, one is therefore defining humanity and culture. Thus, myth is a discourse. However, according to Levi-Strauss, the elements of myth, like the phonemes of a language, acquire meaning only when they are arranged in accordance with certain structural relations. As a result, structuralism attempts to examine the rules that govern the relationships between myth elements. And as I stated earlier, by breaking the myth down into its constituent elements, one attempts to uncover the unconscious meaning or dialogue found in the binary relationships of the uh, myth's elements. Thus, uh, Levi Strauss views myth as a language, and meaning uh, within myths is based upon contrast and distinctions. And so, having thus said, I think this matches what we said about myths and goes next on our totem pole. Wow. Well, I read somewhere that magic was also very important and it could be structurally analyzed. And um, magic is a way of helping the human mind cope with and manipulate the, ma the natural world. An anthropologist subscribing to the structural point of view, like us, would probably find parallels between the magic and science. Magic was used to kill enemies, to prevent being killed. It's used to ease the birth of a child, to enhance the beauty of dancers, to protect, fisher to protect fishermen, or even ensure the harvest. And um, science is also used to utilize, is also utilized to achieve those goals in some societies. In killing enemies, we find the scientific concept of biological warfare. In the, in the, and in the prevention of death, science has made great leaps in curing people from a variety of injuries, including those caused by warfare. Um, enhancing the beauty of dancers in one society might be compared to cosmetic su uh, surgery in another, while easing the birth of a child in America can be easily remedied by an epidural. Uh, meteorology can be used to predict the weather so fishermen won't get caught in a, a squall or choppy seas, and the uh, reassurance of a successful harvest can be made with fertilizers or other farming techniques. Uh, many anthropologists have pointed out while a society is considered inferior for practicing or believing in magic, the supposedly superior society rests its faith in the ideas of science. So while a man is rational for using intelligence to predict the outcome of an event, another man can be considered irrational for relying on magic to do the same. Other anthropologists have brought to light the argument that since magic is not a valid way of thinking, then where did science come from? Why did science evolve so slowly and so late in the history of mankind? Um, he summed up the parallels between magic and science very well, uh, saying that, quote, under the lo lofty scaffolding of modern science, the mental patterns of the contemporary city dweller in the West were much like those of his Neolithic ancestor. The task of the anthropologist was to find those patterns. So in that statement, he summarized not only the parallels between magic and science, but the uh, goals of a structuralist anthropologist. <laughs> I think that. I do believe that this would be the next block on our little totem pole. I think you're right. That's the magic one. It fits. Wow. You know, another very important aspect of structuralism is the concept of totem totemism. Totemism is a practice that is that is expressed by many primitive cultures around the world. Totem refers to a category of things such as animals, plants, celestial bodies, or ancestral beings. 
that are associated with a particular <coughs> clan or group. The totem name normally refers to the clan that is associated with the totem. This name and clan emblem is integrated into the group and is honored during religious practices. According to Emil Durkheim, the totem is the very type of sacred thing. The sacredness of a totem is important only to the specific group that it identifies with. The totem plays a large role in creating specific taboos around the object that is thought to be sacred. According to Durkheim, religion originated in the deification of the collective consciousness. This collective consciousness came about when different clans began to come together. The only way for the clans to express their collective consciousness was to employ a system of symbols. These symbols were a way I just lost my place. For clans to reaffirm the group's identity within the wider compound society. The celebration or reaffirmation was the clan's idea of a religion. This helped to ensure the survival of a society as a system by reaffirming each segment's place in the whole. An important aspect that has come out of t studying totemism from a structuralist perspective is the relation of linguistics to totemism. The Swiss linguist Saussure was developing theories of linguistics at the same time Durkheim was developing his theories of totemism. Saussure interpreted Durkheim's theories of totemism and came up with a theory about communication through signs. Saussure believed that all languages came about by emanating the sounds that an object made. For example, one person could describe a bee by making a buzzing sound or describe a dog by making a barking sound. So Sir noticed that language has the same qualities as Durkheim's collective consciousness, such as existing prior to the birth of those who use it. Because of these similarities, so Sir concluded that each clan is arbitrarily associated with a specific totem, just like each idea is arbitrarily associated with a specific sound. The sound is a signifier and the idea is the signified. According to Saussure, the significance of each clan's totemic emblem derives from its place in the structure of a segmentary society, just as the meaning of each linguistic sign is determined by its position in the total language. Totemism is indeed a very important aspect of structuralism. It helps to give each segment a place in the whole of society while creating social order and religion. Wow. I think that sums everything up. It sounds like a good theory. Perfect. I don't know why everybody else doesn't use it. Well, although structuralism is a relatively good theory, it has not gone without criticism through over time. Oh. One important <laughs> criticism deals with the gathering of information about a specific society. An example of this problem is the way Levi Strauss often gathered his information. Often he would get his information from secondary sources such as missionaries, and they may not have been as skilled in gathering data in order to perform these studies. Another ensuing problem is the application of one idea to the whole of the analysis. Often many anthropologists would use Durkheim's theory of a collective consciousness and apply it to every culture being studied. Studies have shown that each person may interpret stories or myths in a different way from another person. These separate interpretations reveal that there may not be a collective consciousness across all cultures. cultures. Another very problematic aspect of structuralism is that structuralism attempts to decode cultures, decode exotic cultures. It attempts to show that familiar messages can be found universally in unfamiliar signifiers. Problems with this arose with Levi Strauss's way of conducting his research. Levi Strauss thought that he could penetrate exotic myths by simply studying books and literature about these cultures. The reason Levi Strauss thought he could do this was based upon the belief that the myths contained structures that were a direct product of universal cognitive structures that the human mind used in order to make sense of the world around him or her. Levi Strauss believed that myths made thought possible by using particular Im imagery in universal structures. The problem behind this particular way of thinking is that it was believed that one could apply these principles and that it would hold true to both primitive societies as well as modern ones. This does not take into account that some societies may think of the world in a different way than others. Because of this possibility, they may read into myths in a different way than was originally thought of by the analyst. I think that completes our dialogue on structuralism. And it's beautiful. As a result, completes our totem pole. So uh, I'll go get the curator, see and if he we'll approves. Put it on display. Okay. Thank you.
Hello, and thanks for tuning in to the Anthropological Informational Network, the only all-encompassing network of its kind. You're just in time for Anthropological Oldies, a segment which features reruns of I Can't Believe It's Not Science, the show that tries to sell different anthropological theor theoretical perspectives. Today we'll be looking at ethnoscience, which first aired in 1956, and later at cognitive anthropology, which first aired in 1970. So, shall we take an anthropological journey back in time? Are you wet? Oh, oh, oh. Anxious. Okay. Go ahead. Are you tired of old ethnography? Does it seem too outmoded? If you answered yes to at least one of these questions, you're in luck. The answer? Ethnoscience. What is ethnoscience? I don't know, but I can bake an apple pie that'll knock your socks off. Well, today we have ethnoscientist Harold C. Conklin joining us, and he's going to tell us all about ethnoscience. So please give a warm, unbiased welcome to Harold Conklin, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Well, thank you. Thank you for being with us today, Harry. Can I call you Harry? Of course. So, Harry, people are, anthropologists at least, are calling ethnoscience the new and improved ethnography. But what exactly is ethnoscience? Ethnoscience is a new and improved brand of ethnography that presents cultural descriptions from a native's point of view using a more systematic methodology. So how is it better? Well, I think it's easiest to answer this by comparing these two boxes here. Hmm. Well, this one shows a, a picture of the world, but I notice that it's only the Western world. Uh, this, this seems rather inaccurate and downright unscientific. Precisely. <laughs> that was one of ethnography's problems. It applied a Western bias to ethnographic data and thus distorting it. And on the other, and on the other main problems were also things you mentioned. It also its, its methods were unscientific, so it provided us a, with inaccurate culture descriptions. And we as anthropologists need to improve our ethnographic method so that we can better understand foreign cultures and make culture descriptions more accurate and repl replicable so as to allow for cross-cultural descriptions. Well, with a spiffy box like this, it must be the answer. Yes, it's a nice box, but that's not why ethnoscience is the answer to ode ethnography. It says here under ingredients that it contains elements of Boazian thought, linguistic analysis, and an emic approach. Let me begin by discussing the emic approach. Ethnoscience presents culture descriptions from a native's informant's point of view. This is considered the emic approach as opposed to etic approach. Emic and etic, what's the difference? Emic is taken from phonemics, the study of linguistics meaning. It is the insider's point of view or, in other words, the point of view of the speaker being investigated. Etic is taken from phonetics, the study of linguistic sounds. It is the insider, it is the outsider's point of view, or the point of view of the investigator. So what's all this about linguistics? Ethnoscience is very influenced by the field of linguistics, mainly the structure of language. It is based on some some of the methodology developed by members of the Prague School of Linguistics in the 1920s. It is also based on 1930s linguistic theories, particularly the Sapir and Whorf hypothesis developed by Edward Sapir, a student of Franz Boas, and Benjamin Whorf, a student of Sapir. Their hypothesis said that people's perceptions of the world around them was shaped by their language. Therefore, culture and language were seen by ethnoscientists as closely connected in reproducing the classification system of a language of a language would enable the ethnosciences to think like a native. Sapir and Worf's main example that supported their hypothesis was contrasting the Hopi's language and culture with that of the standard average European, which was the combination of European languages and cultures. They found, for example, that the standard average European languages, when expressing time, will use three days, whereas Hopi's view time more subjectively, seeing the concept of three days as becoming later, not in terms of quantity. Hmm. 
Okay. And uh, getting back to ingredients, tell us about the Boazian influence. The underlying theoretical assumption is that culture is a set of mental models. This was taken from Boaz. What this means to ethnoscientists is that they must understand native conceptual categories in order to think like a native. And uh, what do you mean by native conceptual categories? To answer your question, native conceptual categories are categories into which we place objects and ideas of what the person we of ideas of, of the person we interview. Their means of classification and what we use to then analyze the society. Getting back to Boaz, ethnoscientist also draws upon his historical particularism and, and cultural relativism. So how does it work? I mean, ethnoscience. Ethnoscientists collect huge amounts of material, data and data, on behaviors of the people they study. Yet another influence of Boaz. However, we extend this data collecting to, mental, to the mental aspects, which was suggested by Boaz 50 years ago. Well, it says here, manufactured by American ethnographers, Ward Goodenough, Charles Frake, and yourself, Harold Conklin. Yes, Ward Goodenough and Charles Frake described how to conduct field work and analyze data. I also helped these methods and used them in my research on the Hanuo color categories. He said that field work should employ a highly structured interview aimed at eliciting native conceptual categories called domains. These domains were further divided into smaller categories. Objects and ideas would then be sorted into domains and subdomains, subdomains using con, con, componential analysis. To illustrate, chairs, tables, and sofas are classified within a domain of furniture, and tables could be further divided into end tables and dining room tables. In theory, this method is more systematic and replicable than previous methods, and thus more scientific. Good enough. Well, yes, good enough and freak. Yes, good enough and freak. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, I must bring up what the critics are saying about ethnoscience. It says here they have argued that ethnoscience's approach makes cross-cultural comparison impossible because each culture has its own unique set of conceptual categories and therefore could only be described in its own terms. Not only that, but it is equally impossible to get inside the head of an informant to see how he thinks and what he believes. And even if this were possible, individual variation within a culture would mean that cultural descriptions would not truly reflect the whole society. Furthermore, isn't it plain and practical to describe all the domains of a society? I mean, if you research too few domains, you don't get a very thorough picture of a society. On the other hand, it would be impossible to subject all objects and ideas of a particular culture to this kind of method. Um, how do you respond to this? We realize descriptions for all domains of a society would be an impossible undertaking. What is important in all this is what we discover through research, not necessarily the actual information gathered in research. For example, I find <clears throat> that what researchers had once considered as color confusion by the Hanuo is actually a lack of understanding of how the Hanuo distinguished color. The Hanuo, in naming colors, take into account, for example, the moisture content, the texture, and the shine of the object surface. So the, sci the, the ethnoscientific method helps anthropologists see how people of other cultures see things, and it does so in systematic, consistent matter so that, so that it can be replicated. We're on to something very big here. Something is going to change, something very big here that's going to change anthropology. Wow. Well, Harry, that's all the time we have for today, but thanks for being with here. Uh, thanks for being here with us and uh, helping us understand about uh, this new and exciting field uh, called ethnoscience. It was my pleasure. Okay, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you would like to subscribe to this new brand of uh, ethnography that promises scientific results, please call 555-1212. I'm Ethel. See you next week.
There's a new and exciting field called cognitive anthropology that is actually learning how the human mind functions. Is that far out or what, people? Today we'll be talking to cognitive anthropologist Stephen A. Tyler, and he's going to expand our minds about uh, cognitive anthropology and the ideas behind it. So people, please welcome Stephen Tyler. So, Mr. Tyler, enlighten us. What's all the hype? What is cognitive anthropology? I'm looking at this old box here that Harold Conklin left about 15 years ago, and then I'm looking at the cognitive one, and aside from the groovy colors, they're basically the same box. It, they both contain many of the same ingredients, such as Boazian thought, linguistic analysis, and an emic approach. Is this all some great cosmic coincidence? No, it's no coincidence. Cognitive anthropology developed out of ethnoscience in the late 60s and early 70s, so it shares many of its elements and uses similar methods. But cognitive anthropology takes ethnoscience to a new level by studying how the mind actually functions. We believe that the human brain has an innate structure, and so there are universal cognitive processes. And through linguistic, linguistic analysis, and through the analysis of nati native conceptual categories, we can understand these innate structures and learn more about human thought and culture. My contemporaries and I see culture as a mental phenomena, as the ethnoscientists did. We focus on rules by which objects and ideas are classified and try to understand cognition cross-culturally, studying both the content of cognition and the actual thought processes of different cultures. That's so culturally relative. It says here, a new and improved alternative to traditional ethnography. Yes, in traditional ethnography, culture was more a creation of the anthropologist than, the, than about the people being studied. So we proposed the anthropology be more like philosophy or mathematics, having its own formal, logical models of culture. This way we can eliminate the subjectivity of, and ethnocentrism involved in studying and describing pe uh, people different from us. Oh yeah, man, we got to do away with our Western bias and our ethnocentrism. I hear you, cognitive anthropology is the pill that society needs. Yes, well, the world is chaotic, and we as humans must make sense of things. We do so through classification systems. However, unlike Claude Levi-Strauss, I do not believe that systems of classification reflect underlying universal organiz organizing principles. I believe the classification system of a culture is unique to that culture because of that culture's unique history. So we should focus on extensive cultural descriptions of individual cultures using the methodology developed by ethnoscientists. And if there are any universals, cognitive anthropology certainly has the potential to discover them, but only through massive amounts of research. Imagine that, people. Cognitive anthropology may enable us to discover universal principles. And that's what it's all about, people. We're all one. Well, we're out of time. So um, thanks, Mr. Tyler, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And thank you out there for watching. If you would like to, subscri to subscribe to this mind-expanding brand of anthropology, call now. 1-800-555-1212. Operators are standing by. Research in cognitive anthropology is still being done today. It has come a long way since its early days due to advances in anthropology, psychology, and artificial intelligence. Research in these areas has shown that cog cognition is much more complex than the ethnoscientists and early cognitive anthropologists previously thought. Today, it has been determined that much of knowledge is non-linguistic and non-sequential, and anthropology and psychology explain cognition in terms of schema theory and, and connectionism. 
both of which acknowledge the nonverbal, nonlinear nature of origin. Thank you. Welcome back to I Love Lucy reruns, or, <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, what we've seen in all three areas covered today is structuralism, ethnoscience, and cognitive anthropology. I see them as, as uh, kind of building blocks to what eventually becomes uh, postmodern anthropology in more contemporary terms, or even poststructural anthropology. Uh, and I want to start some with some basic... Um, Precepts, I guess, they're kind of standard understandings that anthropologists have. They, if you will, they, they provide uh, uh, mythical uh, constructs that anthropologists share in, the kind of uh, cultural logic that they have and that they think that everyone else shares with them and then they try to apply to cultural data. Uh, all three of these approaches heavily rely on the use of linguistics or the study of language in a cultural context and they, how they apply these insights that they derive from the study of linguistics to cultural data. And uh, uh, some missing figures here in our little uh, study uh, had to do with such commonly known, oh excuse me, we'll just start over there because that's misspelled. <laughs> Uh, uh, names have been referred to before, again by uh, Dr. Rasmussen in her uh, lecture to us. But I want to, to bring your attention now, because I think it's appropriate that we talk about this theory of, of linguistic relativity. And it really was one of the earlier attempts by American anthropologists uh, to bring these two uh, areas of study together. In other words, in one sense, it's not bringing anything together because, after all, language is a part of culture. But in another sense, since anthropology has seen fit in its history, especially American anthropology, to divide our field into a four-field approach, meaning, again, biological anthropology, ethnology, linguistics, and archaeology, um, one of the earlier attempts by anthropologists to, to set aside a, a certain linguistic a set of notions and to apply them to the study of cultural data became formulated in this thing that in this theory that we today call the superior wharf hypothesis and in the superior wharf hypothesis the the notion was that uh, the the language a person speaks influences the way in which they perceive the world uh, and in fact in more extreme statements of it it would even be said that the language a people speak determine the way in which they perceive the world. It was almost a causal kind of um, theory. So that, for example, uh, in American English, we have uh, a linear thinking. And if we look at the structure of English grammar, you find that you have, uh, when you conjugate a verb, you have... Um, uh, you know, past tense. I'm going to simplify this so you just get the ideas rather than an extended discussion. Uh, you have past tense, present tense, and future tense. And uh, 
Americans are familiar with this, uh, given the way that they speak English, but also I think the note of commonality here is that they are linear in their thought and in their language. So that the way they perceive the world, the way in which they understand events that occur, is in a linear fashion, having a beginning, a middle, and an end. Well, that's also then reflected in their grammatical construction. In other words, if we look at the language construction of, of English and even other Western languages, you know that we have ways about uh, dis uh, describing an event that occurs in the past, we can distinguish that from the way in which an event is occurring in the present, and we can further distinguish those events and describe those events which we think, quote, will occur in the future. Because time is very important to Westerners, and, in, and it's embedded then in their, the way they speak and in their Western language. Um, let's take a contrary example. Let's look at the Trobrianders of uh, the Pacific, who were studied extensively by an anthropologist by the name of Malinowski, whom you may have <laughs> heard of before. Uh, and in Trobriandes, they had no such linear conceptualization of events around them. In some ways, the uh, way one might perceive of Trobriand culture, when looking at it from the viewpoint of Malinowski and other observers of it, was that their language had no conjugation of verbs. Uh, you know, we always, as anthropologists, always had been, been involved in the study of languages, especially the study of those languages of the people whose culture we were trying to understand. And when they looked at Trobrian culture, one of the things they noted is that uh, it didn't seem to be important to a Trobriander to distinguish something which had occurred in the past or some, another event which might be occurring today or they felt no need to tell somebody what might be occurring in the future. So they didn't have this linear conceptualization of reality that is built into English and is a part then of Western culture and English people's, speaking people's cultures. Um, in a way, it was, uh, how did they explain this then? How did they talk about change? How did they, uh, how did they, uh, it isn't that they were dumb and they couldn't perceive that something occurred yesterday and something is occurring today and something might be occurring in the future. It's the way in which they uh, culturally conceptualized it. In other words, there's always this interconnection between the language and the culture. Uh, in Trobrian culture, it was felt that uh, it was kind of a, a metamorphosis, if you will, so that uh, if you had a bouncing baby boy on the one hand and father time on the other, it isn't that um, they were mutually exclusive categories. In other words, in their mind, a magic chant had to be said or something had to, to occur in a religious ritual which brought about that metamorphosis, that transgeneration, that change from the baby boy to the old man. In our case, see, we see it as aging. Again, that's a linear notion about how people change. It's not a metamorphosis. It's not something that occurs because something outside it must also occur. And then they found in the ethnography of speaking, which was a methodology that later became employed by both cognitive anthropologists and ethnoscientists and structuralists, they found that uh, 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 in studying the chants, the religious chants that these Trobrianders use, that it not only applied then to um, aging or something occurring before, occurring now, occurring in future, but it also applied to such things as crops. In other words, for them to have a maturation of crops, for them to go from something they planted to something that they were going to harvest, it wasn't just that they had in their own minds to be skilled uh, farmers or agriculturalists or whatever you might call somebody in a non-urban peasant context, um, they had to uh, know the chants, they had to know the religious sayings that had to be a kind of magic, if you will, that had to be performed in order for those transformations to come about. And this became a fascinating example of this relationship 
between language and culture. On the one hand, you had the linearity of, of English speaking people's cultures and, and this notion of history, history rather, or historical insight being embedded in the way in which we describe those cultural understandings and having these notions that there has to be something that precedes, something that's occurring, and we know that something will occur in the future. And this is, you know, just embedded in every part of the way in which we perceive the world. There is no way in English-speaking world that you can separate that linear notion out, and, and otherwise you would not be able to communicate. Uh, another English speaker would not understand what you're saying. By the same token, uh, Trobrianders wouldn't understand linearity. They see things, again, as, as becoming uh, metamorphized, as becoming something which uh, changes from one state to another. And it's changes in that one state to another by the very fact that uh, certain kinds of religious rituals are said in, in their presence, and they, in turn, bring about that kind of magical context, at least in our mind, magical, in their minds, probably naturalistic. Uh, context of, of bringing those kinds of changes about. Well, these concerns then that superior morph give, give us between the study of language on the one hand and the study of culture on the other was much more pervasive. But this is the idea that became popular and became well known outside anthropology as well as among anthropologists. And uh, these folks uh, wrote in the 30s and 40s and and their articles are still read by students in anthropology today, and, uh, and, and rightly so, because they uh, strike at the very heart of what is this relationship between language and culture. Well, in doing that, in, in raising those issues and in becoming aware, one of the, the goals of anthropologists that kind of transcend any one of the viewpoints that we heard about today be they structuralists, ethnoscientists, or cognitive anthropologists, is this attempt to get at the ultimate nature of reality. Is this attempt to, as anthropologists who have to, after all, study many different cultures and many different contexts and many different time periods, once we include archaeology, you have to come up, if you will, with, you know, what are the universals of human behavior? What are the particulars in the study of any one culture? And in doing that, you can see then that there's kind of a, um, a progression here, a progression of thought, if you will, chapters or building blocks as in our totem pole in terms of the way in which anthropologists viewed their subject matter and how they, the methodologies they employed to, to study their subjects. And then secondly, where that thought went and how, what it, where it's going to go. In other words, I'm also giving you a linear um, perception here because, after all, I'm a Westerner and my native language is English, and what else would you have me do? <laughs> if I spoke any other way, if I gave it any other context, you really wouldn't understand what I was talking about. But to, uh, when I look at the structuralists, especially the works of Claude Levi Strauss and uh, you know, he was one of the first anthropologists to, to look at the philosophies, if you will, of primitive peoples. And by the way, for those of you, if you ever have to give such a presentation again or refer to it again, Tristropique can be state, translated as world on the wane. <laughs> and that might be easier to say. Um, uh, and it was, uh, again, uh, 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 Levi-Strauss was not trained as an anthropologist. He was trained as a philosopher or trained in the very general way in terms of his education and came to the subject matter of anthropology and was attracted to anthropology because of his affection and interest in uh, Franz Boas. I remember an interview with, uh, with Levi Strauss where you know, the interviewer, who was a fairly prominent newsman but whose identity can remain unknown, <laughs> uh, you know, asked him, you know, who, who influenced you the most in terms of your own theoretical formulations and your understandings. And without hesitating, he answered Franz Boas, which, you know, I was kind of taken aback because I would have thought in the world of French intellectual uh, thought that Franz Boas would be considered small potatoes, so to speak. <laughs> uh, but not so. Uh, he particularly was attracted to Boas because uh, Boas really made these attempts to not be biasing the cultural data that he collected. 
when he worked among the Kwakutl of the northwest coast or when he studied the Baffin Islanders in uh, the Canadian provinces. You know, his, his whole, uh, one of his major goals was to study the culture of other peoples without bringing or allowing those biases to occur. Well, obviously he failed, Boaz did, but the attempt was laudatory and the attempt was what uh, I think Levi Strauss appreciated. So he was uh, Levi Strauss in his case, an instructionalist case, they're trying to come up, if you will, with something that transcends any one culture. And it can be applied as kind of a, 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 a set of structural principles that, that can be applied anywhere and everywhere if we're talking about the cultures of human beings. So the study of myth comes quite... Uh, uh, naturally to this kind of endeavor. I know one of the uh, myths that Levi-Strauss talks about which has cultural currency and which transcends one group of people as compared to another is the, and, and something I think most of you will also know of, and that's the myth where um, Chicken Little is worried about the sky falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and uh, uh, everybody has to take cover and hide. And, and of course, most of us really don't pay any attention to that. We see that as kind of a curious, antiquated folk tale that comes to us from our history down to the present. But what Levi Strauss saw was that it had cross-cultural or universal currency, that many cultures had a version of this kind of uh, myth, if you will. And therein lies the seeds of thought that take place. Here you have these myths that kind of have uh, expression in many different cultures. The particulars are different, but the underlying structure, the underlying moral principles, if you will, or the underlying cultural understandings are there for you to tease out and see that this mythical account for this cultural grouping is similar to this account over here for a different cultural grouping. So then that became a distinction that was important. You know, that there were underlying structures that had larger and more enduring uh, reality than did the actual expression of those particular uh, legends or myths or account or folklore information. Because uh, earlier, I think I told you, in American anthropology and indeed in anthropology in general, there was this closer association with the study of folklore, which includes, I think, the study of myths and the study of creation myths and legends and oral histories in, in general and that kind of approach. It's always been a very important part of anthropology. Now, one of the ways in which uh, Levi Strauss's work suffers, I think, is that it's always at the, at the hands of translators because he does not write in English, he writes in French, so the various translations of his works suffer accordingly depending on who the translator is and that's why you will find sometimes a new edition or a new um, translation of Levi Strauss comes out and most of the time that's justified because it's a better translator or the person has a greater acquaintance with French, the nuance of French language so that they can better express what it is that Levi Strauss is trying to tell us. I think it's just strange that in the first place that uh, uh, a noted anthropologist like this is somehow caught up in the uh, problems inherent in uh, another language because after all anthropologists are about the study of other languages, they are about the study of other cultures and, and for an anthropological figure of this magnitude to be limited in his presence by the fact that anthropologists don't speak French does not speak well to their own training or to their own uh, pedigrees, if you will, in a, in a cultural sense, pedigrees. All right, so this is, is one area then, this, this, this area of structuralism. It, uh, a, as we've had before, we had the uh, works uh, being importantly contributed by, by De Saussure and his distinction between la, la parole and la langue, um, his notion that there is a, um, a formal a grammatical way in which people are thought that they should be speaking and indeed that, that seems to be the grammatical structure. And then there's the way they actually speak, la parole, which again, this distinction is important and it's, and it's contributory to uh, applications beyond language. So that uh, his work then leads to, along with others, as again, to, not to repeat, but just to reinforce, that led to, very importantly, to more current writers such as Foucault 
and uh, others who, who take these notions, these structuralist notions, and apply them to the study of society. But you can see that language is an important contributor here, the study of language and its presence as another domain, if you will, of culture. All right, uh, another important distinction which has been talked about today and made reference to is this, again, this notion between emics and edics, or the distinction between phonemics and phonetics. I received a flyer the other day that um, talked about the, uh, an anthropologist uh, that his, one of his works was being redone and it was going to be a new edition was going to be made available. And I, I'm very pleased with it because it was a monograph that I used to assign to a lot of my classes because I thought it got across this, these, this two sets of things really. One was the use of linguistic models in terms of the study of cultural phenomena, extra-linguistic phenomena. Uh, and the other is that it, it uh, was an attempt, really, to get inside the heads of natives, if you will, and to come up with their logic. So that uh, some of these distinctions that we're going to be talking about right now in these next few minutes have to do with the concerns that the students presented earlier, both of the ethnoscientific variety and also of cognitive anthropology. And what James Spradley was trying to do in his monograph, which has this kind of catchy title of uh, the was it urban ethnography or no the study of urban nomads um, uh, or you owe yourself a drunk and who he did was what he did rather was to uh, do an ethnography of uh, skid row bums uh, skid road bums as he called them uh, panhandlers uh, a more uh, common uh, uh, English currency um, in the city of Seattle. And, you know, he was trying to, it was, this was called the New Ethnography, and it was supposed to be kind of revolutionary, and it was supposed to be, as the pres uh, presentation on ethnoscience talked about, it was supposed to be an attempt not only to get into the minds of, of his informants, but also to, to um, develop a methodology, develop a set of techniques that could be applied in many different cultural settings so that he could... Uh, um, present those uh, cultural materials in a non-biased, non-Western, so to speak, manner, even though this was a study of a Western culture. Uh, and so what he did was he interviewed a lot of these uh, panhandlers, and, and it, you know, it, it, it really did summarize. I, I saw in that one monograph, and in, in the work of that one anthropologist, James Spradley, who, by the way, his career was cut short by an untimely death, um, I saw kind of the essence of what, up to that point anyway, uh, was the essence of anthropology as compared, say, with the essence of sociology. If you look to uh, sociological classics, if you look to functionalist underpinnings, if you look to that area of social science thought, you saw that he was talking about um, uh, the hobos, and so they would treat uh, panhandlers, if you will, as social problems, as deviants. In the context of uh, James Bradley's approach to the same top topic, ethnoscientifically and cognitive anthropology, he saw the hobos, the bums, the panhandlers, if you will, as having a culture of their own. So this was prior to uh, really a Marxist impression upon anthropology where conflict theory was not taken as seriously as being a part of anthropological thought. And so you kind of get this contradistinction here. Here's the same topic, panhandlers, bums, what have you. On the one hand, by sociologists, they were presented as bums, as deviants, as somebody who does not subscribe or is a part of our larger, more complex society that we call American or Westerners. And on the other, you have this Spradley approach where they were seen as being a cultural phenomena of their own. They were not seen as deviants or miscreants. They were seen as uh, another example yet of human expression and a manifestation of these wonderfully articulate things that we call human beings. So all of these approaches that we've uh, covered today or that the students covered, structuralism, ethnoscience, and cognitive